All right, welcome to another episode of Arthritic Bourbon Bikers. We're out in the garage again today because we're practicing social distancing, and the weather has cooled off a bunch. Uh, we had probably eighty mid eighties yesterday, yeah. I would guess, low to mid eighties yesterday. Today the high is going to be fifty, and tonight there's a freeze warning. Thirty Holy degrees. Missouri. Thirty degrees is supposed to be the low tonight. Love Missouri. So we thought, hey, another great time to get together. Just have some time to get a little social time in, but still keep an appropriate distance. Drink some coffee, sit out in the garage. So we apologize if there's echo, if you hear cars go by, you hear the mailman, birds chirping, whatever it is. Welcome to real life. So you had an idea for some topics. What's the topic of the day you want to start with? Well, since we're in the 49 plus or minus range, yep. and we complain about arthritic conditions and whatnot, it's... Yes difficult each season to ramp up your miles and get to touring cycling shape. And I think we've both kind of had some experience with that recently. And uh, I wanted to talk about some tricks. Love Tips it. and tricks. I love it. I love it. Definitely, you're coming out of winter and you're getting ready for touring weather and you want to get out there and do some rides. That's the hard part about coming into spring sometimes is getting your mileage up. And we talked a little bit about that in the last podcast where we were talking about pandemic cycling. But, man, that is tough. It's tough to uh, get to where you can do those 40, 50, 60, 70. Heck, by the end of last year you, or end of last summer, you were doing those 80, 90, 100-mile days. So yeah, what's, uh, tell us the story a little bit. Well, you know, I think part of it, we already hinted at this. We're in Missouri in just in tw less than 24 hours. We're... 30 degree difference and it's going to rain and freeze warning. So in some parts of the world and the country, man, it's, it's really difficult. And so I, I'm not as tough as I'd like to be. So in the winter, uh, sometimes fall and spring, when it gets cold, weather's bad. I just don't get on the bike. I can, I can weather the hot temperatures better than anything else. And so I find that I spend spring and only part of the summer getting myself in shape biking and then at some point fall and winter i just spend the rest of the time getting out of shape and then uh, making decisions i'm going to regret <laughs> right well and so when you come into spring are you like me in that well i guess i'll just say how i do it like when i come into spring the first thing i do is i'm doing those 16 to 22 mile rides that's sort of like my entry point it seems like now yeah um is to just get those entry level days in, and I just try to think about, for me personally, I try to think about volume. When I say volume, I mean more like frequency of time in the saddle. Having multiple days in a row of just riding, even if it's 16 to 20 miles, I'm just trying to get my butt in shape, in essence, so that saddle time is there and kind of, I can spend the hours in there. And then I kind of find the legs tend to come. But what's your technique? Well, yeah, that's a, I, I try to have, try to have a rough plan, but the plan really is about what you're saying. I try to be consistent. And even though I might have a day where I just don't feel like it, at least get out there. Um, I tend to do it in, I would say 10 or 20 mile blocks. You know what I mean? It just seems like we have the Bear Creek Trail. And then if you get out to the Katy Trail, everything is about a 10 or 15 minute segment between trailheads 10 or 15 mile segment but yeah not miles. minute yeah yeah, yeah. sorry 10 or 15 miles. uh and so that's kind of how i i set it up i'm either going to do 20 or 40 or 60 almost well if you get to the trail but it's all flat and so then it's really a matter of as you say time in the saddle and miles because that's the hardest part like you see the legs come the knees they get there but man it's the it's the caboose it's always the problem for me you know and uh, once you kind of get that going, I feel like I just, I think I just crossed the threshold into f feeling like I'm, I'm about got that part licked now. Yeah. And I put a lot of miles in the last two weeks, and uh, I feel like it's there. So how many miles do you think you put in the last couple of weeks? Well, according to my, my sort of estimated math, about 300 in the last two weeks, which is a lot. Uh, and, I, and I know that's why I've been kind of staggering around for the last few days, but after the long ride yesterday, I feel better today. Like I, I feel like I accomplished something yesterday by just kind of bearing with it, going through the 
the un uncomfortable part. I, I think I think now I'm I'm going to be okay as long as I can keep putting the miles in. So here's a question. So when you're you may not plan this out, I don't know, but is there any plan in like long day, short day, long day, or do you alternate, or is there any schedule at all, or what's your what's your method? Is it just weather related, or I try to do two, at least two, maybe longer rides a week, longer relative to what I'm doing. If I'm doing a bunch of twenties, I'd like to do a forty once or twice a week. Uh, now that I've done a couple of those, I'm trying to do some sixty miles once or twice a week at least, but. It's weather dependent and how I'm feeling and my schedule. If I have lots of things going on, I'm not gonna tackle a 60 mile ride. Um, but uh, I've done it on some days where the weather's not great simply because that's when I had the time. It's a little more of a discipline then, but you still enjoy it. I saw somebody once on I don't know if it was Instagram or a Facebook cycling group and he basically said, I wish I could remember who it was, he said, you know, you know, you don't feel like it. Just get out there and get started. Within a few miles, you're going to find your, your, your sort of rhythm, and you're not going to regret going out to ride. Yeah, I agree with that. I tend to find just in general when I'm riding, it really takes me 10 miles to get warmed up, honestly, before I start kind of really starting to feel it. And I don't know what to attribute that to. You'll hear folks talk about how the body reacts to things in different times. And, you know, I was watching and following some videos both of us had kind of seen this guy who was riding the great divide and one of the things he talked about is he had ridden for i think it was 20 something different days doing the divide and he had to take three days off for a root canal when he was close to denver which is just a crazy story but happens i guess you know so he stops and he goes into denver and he gets this root canal finds a dentist that's willing to do it and he has to take three days off riding and then after three days, he goes back, gets on the bike, and starts riding again. And one of the things he commented about was how it was almost like his body was like, what are you doing? Like, I thought we were done with this. <laughs> you know, and I think it made me think a lot about how I think your body does react to different things, whether it's training or continuous riding. It does take a while for you to kind of get the muscles and the body in, into that zone, I guess, where it's like, okay, this is what we're doing for a little while, it seems like. So now we have to really gear up for that. Well, I think physiologically we have to eventually admit that, that you know, when you're you know, a guy in your 40s and 50s, your hormone levels are changing. And you're just not, you're not able to jump up and go ride 50 miles all of a sudden like you could when you were in your 20s. Yeah. And then when you take a few days off, you, you do have to build it back up. I think it's very real. Yeah, the physiology behind that. And I think recovery time is much slower too. So I think you know, whereas maybe when we were younger, we used to be able to ramp up faster yeah. to riding more miles. It takes longer to get back in that groove as time goes on. I don't think the body recovers as quickly. I don't think the muscle comes back as quickly. You know, or the maybe the metabolism adjusts as quickly as it used to. And what part do you think? if any, food plays in this. Have you seen any correlation? I bet it does. I haven't experimented much other than avoiding the bunk, you know? So if, when I'm going, you know, two to four hours at a time or so, uh, and this is what I think helped me recently here, is I, I just think my body is less forgiving. And so I've been more intentional about eating a snack about every hour, hour and a half maybe, just a little Larabar or something, whatever it is, you know, whatever your choice of sort of uh, cycling fuel is, do that. And hydration, you know, I'm terrible at that. I only drink if I'm hot. And if, but if I can tell myself, okay, do this now. And I've intentionally taken out the stuff in the middle triangle of the bike to replace it with more uh, bottle cages now. I just have, have more stuff, one fewer, one or two fewer bags and more water. I think the, the, the fuel, the food and the and water, I have to be more intentional. I've thought about setting timers. Yeah. Because you know, if it's cold, I'm still, I'm still burning through the water, you know? That's the thing I've noticed in the spring when riding is that because the temperatures are lower, and we noticed this too when we were out uh, down in Texas at Big Bend biking down there, it's so dry there, but it wasn't hot. Yeah. It was like 70 degree highs of 70 degrees in the day, but it was really super dry. So dry that it's like you needed chapstick and stuff on your lips. And, and 
because you're not hot and you're not sweating, you don't think you need to drink as much, but you're still losing water. You're still burning up water and, and hydration. And so I've tried to be, also try to be more cognizant of the fact that I need to be drinking water semi-frequently. Um, even trying to kind of mix in things to, you know, hydration tablets or other things to try to kind of replenish some of those things a little bit. Um, I love a caffeine boost at the same time. So if I've got the, any of those drink mixes that kind of yeah. drops in some, some caffeine, that's a good hit. But also you hear a lot of folks talk about trying to eat at least a couple hundred calories an hour if you can. Yeah. Now there are you're still you're still fighting a losing battle. So like the average person at our age group is probably burning somewhere. It depends on your pace and what you're doing, obviously. But you're probably burning somewhere between 400 and 500 calories an hour if you're continuously pedaling at a 10 mile an hour pace. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. So you're still losing ground at that rate. Yeah, yeah. But just having something in the body so it just keeps coming back. And I think for me, a big difference is a good a good breakfast. Starting out the day with some food and and then when you're getting home, putting that back in, I try to eat a dinner that's definitely a heavy protein dinner, uh, but also just not being afraid to eat food uh, and kind of replenish that so you can recover a little bit. Yeah, I've been doing a better job of that too. Trying to, <laughs> again, I think the older you get, the more important it becomes, yeah. you know, because you just can't go eat the crap. And feel good about it. We talked yesterday about how you know those things aren't as available on along the trail as they have been historically yeah. too. So you got to plan yeah. and take more stuff along. But I think that helps your rides, yeah. You know, be more successful for the distance and keep you kind of fueled up for the for the long haul. But I did find myself kind of craving kind of at the longer point in a ride the other day. I kind of wished I'd have had some kind of a of a sugar hit, a glucose hit yeah. or something. I didn't have anything. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. I had kind of consumed my snacks for the day and I was on my way back and I didn't have a long distance to go. So it wasn't a big deal. I only had like seven or eight miles to go. But at that moment, my, it was almost like I was craving like, man, I wish I had a, a gummy bear or, a, yeah. you know, just anything, like yeah. any kind of a little glucose hit. Well, you know, what's funny, the way I've been doing things now is because we're under this, uh, you know, this pandemic, so we're trying to be solitary, away from everybody. Um, I have been putting the bike in the car and driving somewhere between 15 and even 40 miles and then getting on the trail and going to a... And I like that because it's a place of the trail I haven't been in a long time. It's just, you know, change up the scenery, but um, it's less crowded for sure. But then what you find is if you start feeling bad, you're thirsty, you're hungry, you start having some mechanical noises and you're thinking, oh crap. You know, I'm two hours from my car, which is an hour from my house. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so that's uh, something I've, I've started thinking about. Um, but I had another epiphany yesterday, and that is, and people know this, People are probably going to hear me say this and go, well, duh. That's why they have these products out there. But I've been more intentional about the chamois cream and the, the, the skin maintenance. Um, and I think that was part of my success yesterday when I came home not feeling terrible. It's because I did that. Well, let's break this down a little bit because there's a couple of things when you think about riding long distances. The first thing that I, that most, I think a lot of us tend to notice is saddle pain of some sort, right? And there's a couple different kinds of saddle pain. There's what I would call more tailbone style pain. Mm -hmm. So it's just like your sit bones, your tailbone, they all kind of ache from just being on a pressure point for a long period of time. Yep. And then you've got what I would call uh, skin, skin breakdown or pain, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's what you were talking a little bit about yesterday, right? Is this, yeah. you kind of had worked through the tailbone pain, which do you think that's just a related to time? I think it is time, and and I still think you know the more I I drop some pounds over time, I think it just helps. It helps not, but as much pressure on those bones. But I think a lot of it is just getting used to it again. You know, we all know the quickest way to uh, lighten the load on the bike is to lighten your own personal load because we're the heaviest thing on the bike. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, try to cut ten pounds off of your touring gear; it's almost impossible. But yeah. cut ten pounds off your body; totally possible. Yeah. Yep. For lots of us. And so. it keeps yielding dividends, you know, because yeah, you just sure. feel better, you know. But um, 
But yeah, I I, uh, I reapplied yesterday the uh, the chamois cream. Get the stuff, whatever it is that you like. And then uh, the other thing I did is a little bit of, I got this from watching those guys doing the Tour Divide, is after I got back, I kind of cleaned up and and used some other topical product to kind of do some repair. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think that's so, important too. So there's a couple different there's lots of different products out there, but there's a couple different things to think about. A question I have is, did you did you apply before you ever got on the bike? No, I forgot, like okay. an idiot. And so okay. a few miles in is when I stopped and did that. Yeah, okay, that's not uncommon, I don't think. A lot of guys keep it on the bike. You get on, you start pedaling, and you're only going to put it on if you if you feel like you need it. You, and oh. then you notice, oh, hey, something's right. talking. And me. at that point, let's be real, it might be too late. A little too late. You yeah. might have already mm-hmm. incurred some potential yeah. damage. It doesn't mean you have to put it on every time, but... It's maybe something to take into consideration. So if you're out there, you're biking, you should think about, hey, should I go ahead and put some chamois cream on or should I just wing it and then wait and see? Because that first time you notice is usually when there's pain. Right. It's, and it's, what's caused the pain is the fact that something's already jacked up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Yep. there's that question of when to apply. So you got maybe a little ways into your ride, you decide, hey, I'm going to put some, yep. some chamois cream on. Yep. And then it was time to, uh, to reapply um, on the way back. It was, a, it was kind of a round trip deal. And so I stopped and did that. So you went, what, 30 miles in or so? Learned uh, further than I thought. By the time you get to Herman, cross the river, um, it was a total, it was probably 34 miles from start to finish. Of you the, started of the half Tebbets? Yep. So you're on the KD, you started at Tebbets, you went to Herman. Herman and into town. Into town, which yeah. is, you got to go over the bridge and to yeah. get into the town and stuff. And then on your way back, how far back were you in when you decided ballpark would you get? It was probably about halfway back, and I was like, you know, this just needs to happen. I'm just going to redo it. And, yeah. And I, and I also rested, which is another point I need to kind of make is that, you know, I don't rest enough because I'm going flat. I don't feel like I'm getting exhausted, but my butt is taking a beating. You know, just the saddle. Yeah. You just need to stop. It almost makes you wonder, back in the day when guys were riding horses yeah. on a leather saddle, Yeah. How, I wonder how often they took a break. How often did they get off the horse, give the horse a chance to walk munch some around, grass stretch. and drink some water yeah. and walk around, stretch, and get back on the horse and ride again? It's the same principle as yeah. what we're doing. So yeah. something to think about. So you got about halfway back. So you're probably, let's say you're 45 miles in or whatever, and you decide to reapply some chamois cream. And it's fair to say that you, right now, most of the time, you're not wearing bike shorts. Just you're just like doing normal, yep. just your normal gear, normal shorts, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So you reapply, and then when you get back to the car, the, one of the important components everybody needs to think about is cleanup. Yeah, yeah. And really, if you don't have these in your car or on your bike, wet wipes are great for yeah. that kind of stuff. There's multiple reasons for that, as we have learned, mm-hmm. when you're biking. <laughs> yeah. One is you're in the middle of somewhere, an emergency strikes, and you need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Wet yeah. wipes are nice to have around because mm-hmm. you, you can clean up, and they're easy to keep on your bike because yeah. they've got these ones that you use when you're, you know, when you got a kid and you're riding around yeah. portable. You need those little containers that you can yeah. throw in a bag, a, a diaper bag, or whatever. And they're also great to clean up your hands and stuff if you're out somewhere and you need to. Yeah. Work on something. If you had to work on your bike or something and your hands got real dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're a chain person, you got grease all over your, you know, greasy, oily chain or whatever. Wet wipes are great because they'll clean up your hands really well too. So if you're out there and you need that. Well, let's do something that uh, most people know we, we're in healthcare. And particularly older adults, nursing home patients, long term care. And any person that's had any experience in long term care is going to tell you that um You've got to keep skin clean to keep it healthy. And, you know, we're, we don't have the same problems that the elderly do in these situations, but when you have sat on a saddle and had sweat and just debris and, you know what I mean, you're just, you're working, you're really doing some, uh, some, some serious activity, um, it's really good to clean if you can. That is going to help preserve the skin there, and then that's when you reapply. Now, I, I've done... Done that a few times, but not as much as I should. And I think this has been a lesson for me. I'm going to plan that into my, to my cycling, the longer trips. I think because there's no point in kind of being the cowboy and say I'm just going to blast through and do this because it makes it can make for a miserable day. Yeah, and the days after. So talk a little bit about products that you've used 
for chamois cream products, and then we'll talk about sort of maybe recovery products because yeah. I know there's a couple products we've experience, had experience with for the recovery side of things too, but talk about um, what, what have you used? Really two main ones. I've used the, the, the purple tube uh, chamois butter. Yep. And then I got away from that for a while because I couldn't find a two or like a tub of it. I found a tub of the stuff called buttonhole cream, and it has a lot more ingredients and feels like menthol or something in there. You know what I mean? And I like the product, but um, I think I'm drifting back toward the, the chamois butter actually yeah, right now. Me too. I, that's what I use, have always used when I use it, and I've been happy with it, so I've never experimented with anything else. The other thing I liked about it was it came in those nice little small yeah. packages. Like mm -hmm. you can go to the bike store and just get a little cardboard package. And I found, personally, I found that little package would last me a long time because I didn't use it a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. Now maybe I need to consider using it more. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, but longer rides and stuff. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually make an effort to, to, you know, have more of a supply. Um, um, and the other thing, the wipes. You know, there's a, there's like any kind of really good wipe that's not, you know, um, sometimes you get what you pay for. You know, some of the, some of the lesser like scented things and stuff. Don't really care about that. I care about just kind of getting things clean and. You know, yeah, um, but uh, it, I I haven't messed much with recovery products, you know. Yeah, I think the one that we, I think this is the one you're probably referring to, is the Mary Kay product that yeah your wife kind of mm -hmm. turned us on to. Real thick emollient. Yeah, it's a yeah. that stuff's like magic. Yeah, really is. Um, and it's magical for lots of different things, but uh, it, it's really kind of a. It's really thick, I guess. Is I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. It's really thick. It's very, very creamy. Yep. But when you put it on skin, it really does help with recovery. Well, there's a, just a little tidbit we can talk about here. And, you know, when I was rotating as a, as a medical student and a resident, you go through dermatology, and, and they'll tell you. They said, you know, you've got basically, you've got washes, lotions, creams, and ointments. And in that order, they get thicker and more powerful as far as forcing active ingredients to be absorbed in the skin and, and being more protective. So if you get an ointment, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's really what you probably need if you're talking about the problems we're, we're dealing with. Right. You know, lotions, not so much. You know, creams, maybe, but the ointments are probably, they're gonna leave a little residue, but that's probably the best thing for real skin protection. And then the following day, it's important to clean up again. Yeah. Um, whether that's, hey, you're taking a shower in the morning or, hey, you're getting up to ride day two after a tour or whatever, clean up really good, and then you can think about whether you want to reapply uh, you know, a, a chamois cream or whatever for your day as you go out. But I think that that cleanup component is really important because it's a natural area for bacteria, Yep. and that's the thing that gets you in trouble. There are numerous stories of folks who go out on rides or tours who maybe haven't prepared they get into the ride, I'm thinking about one particular story, and they develop some saddle sores that they can never successfully get healed while touring. Yeah. Because once you have those sores, you're going to continue to irritate them by being in the saddle. So you got to cut this off before it reaches that yeah. point. If it reaches the point where it gets sore to, to saddle sores, we're talking open skin of some type, then you got potential problems. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's why I like to kind of think of this as a, a ramping up process because you're not only getting all parts of your body kind of ready for it, but you're learning what your body does, what your skin does, and you're getting it sort of toughened up. And the other thing is, you know, you, f you, you kind of figure out what kind of clothing you need. You know, what, like if I'm not going to wear uh, padded bike shorts, I really have to have some kind of plan about what kind of underwear is really good for what I'm doing. You know, uh, and make sure I have some and, and make sure I'm keeping my laundry up because if I'm all out of those clean underwear and I go with something else, I'm probably going to develop a problem. Yeah, that changes the whole yeah. the chemistry set. Mm -hmm. It does. <laughs> essence, it does. I mean, it's, it's you're talking strange. about it's an experiment, you know, and you threw in a new variable. Yeah, yeah. Some different like kind roll of Roll the dice, product. see what happens. So that's why we all kind of develop the gear we wear and the clothing yeah. and all those things. Mm -hmm. And all of that, it changes as the weather changes too. Which is a real Achilles heel of mine. I do not like the cycling clothes that are widely accepted. I don't like the jerseys. I don't like the pants. 
Um, and so I, it's always a struggle with me. I like to wear stuff that I could easily bike, hike, or go to happy hour in. To me, to me, that's that's it. And there are clothes out there that you can you can use. I you know, yeah. you kind of get what you pay for. But um, I I just I like that. I like the versatility in my in my clothing. And so I, I don't like to be I'm just never been comfortable in the biking gear. So let's talk about you're not wearing bike shorts since this is all related to you know sort of like saddle pain and getting through this what is your go-to choice now for underwear style yeah. clothing so you know this is funny because hi my name's jerry and i have an instagram problem <laughs> <laughs> i will i will be a an, an impulsive instagram purchaser ah instagram don't no listen um and so i came across an ad for this underwear they're called jumper um, a guy, they made it like, I think bam, uh, bamboo, not bamboo fiber, mint, mint fiber, something like that. And uh, it's an old paratrooper started this clothing line. And I, I bought some and I really like them. Really do like them. I find that the, the waistband gets a little bacony, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But so far, so good. And I really do like cycling in those pants, those, those, that underwear. Now, is that a shorter leg or a longer leg? It's kind of okay. mid thigh. It's mid -thigh, not real long. So mid thigh length style. Yeah, at least maybe at different lengths. That's that's what I ended up. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's I fair. I like those. I like those. I I, I can't speak to the longevity because I haven't been using them very long now. Yeah, uh, three pair. So is that fiber more? Would you say it's more like an artificial fiber or more like a cotton eat style? like the feel you know what i mean because yeah most people can relate to the traditional old cotton style underwear versus a polyester style underwear because a lot of the athletic gear underwear yeah. is more polyester it's style. mixed you know it is a it's a natural fiber i'm sure it's mixed with something i should have paid closer attention oh, that's okay. but, that's but i think it i think it feels more cottony to me it feels like a like a kind of a a tight but flexible so it feels Weave. more natural yeah, to you, like I'm, a more natural fiber. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like it. Do you, um, do you remember what the cost was for a pair? They're not cheap. Um, they're like, I want to say around 20 bucks a pair. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's a commitment. And I was like, well, I've struggled with this for a while. I've tried to find the underwear. I bought some merino wool underwear, and those just really didn't last. Maybe bought the wrong brand. I don't know. Um, some of the like Under Armour type stuff that are tech gear, I kind of like those, but not so much for cycling. They're too more, thin. More athletic style. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's my go-to right now. You know the other the other problem that I've had with this has become an underwear conversation, which is kind of a weird thing to talk about, mm -hmm. but it, it's it's real. It's a right. real thing to talk about with cycling. One of the things that I've found that really bugs me about some underwear, and I've tried different ones as well, and I've not. You know, I'm not sold on any particular solution yet either. Is the is the pocket where your junk is going to go in different pairs just <laughs> yeah. are different when you're on the bike? You know, yeah. some of them are more binding and mm -hmm. too tight, and some of them aren't. You know, maybe don't provide enough support. You know, it's just mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a real mixed bag. You really have to when you talk about figuring out what your gear is going to be. You really have to work yeah. to make try different things and see what works. Again, the reason why you need to get out and ride with different things and kind of be consistent. It really is a bit of a of an experiment to find what works for yeah. you. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you're a you're a, you're a sailor, so you think of the shakedown cruise. You do that with your gear, yep. with everything. And uh, there's a little part of me that's like, okay, you know, we're doing this. Um, we have we have some luxuries that everyone doesn't have. I've been able to acquire some good gear, good equipment. Um, and let's just be honest, not everyone is going to A, be able or B, be willing to go out and spend 20 bucks a pair of underwear to see if it's going to work. Acknowledge that, you know. Um, so a lot of this is, you know, is it, is it applicable? For some it is, but you'll find that cyclists <laughs> are willing to do without a lot of other things to pour, pour budget into their, into their, their vice. Very true. Very true. They'll sacrifice, they'll, they'll skip a meal to be able to buy a bicycle part if they yeah. need it. So. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's that. Everybody's got hobbies. Everybody's going to spend their money on something. But cyclists, yeah, they definitely spend money on their bikes. So, I wanted to bring one other thing up, too, about what I found useful, kind of this ramping up issue, is, um, and you don't have to be, you don't have to go overboard on it, but, but some means of tracking, or at least ballpark estimating where you are, how much you're doing today, 
how does that compare to what you're doing now? If you give yourself, like, I want to see what I can do in two weeks or a month, whatever it is. I, I think it's good to have a way to track that. And I, in the past, haven't always been real, real quantitative about that. Um, and I'm not using Strava or anything necessarily, but I'm going on the trail, so it's easy. I know how much I've gone, and, and Google Maps will do it for you, you know. Um, but uh, sometimes if I'm going around town, I might, I might use a product that, that tracks it, you know. Um, but I, I found that helpful because then I can say, yeah, okay, I rode 45 miles today, and this is how I'm feeling, and compared that to what I did last week, I feel better. I'm making progress, you know. So that, I find that to be helpful. I, I totally agree. I have never, I've, I've tried several different products. I've tried the Under Armour app yeah. for biking. It used to be owned by someone else. I can't remember what the name of it is now. Map My Ride. Map My Ride, I think. Map yeah. My Ride is yeah. the name of it, yeah. Under Armour winds up buying it. I used that for a while. I tried Strava, and personally, I didn't like Strava. I didn't find it that great. And I wind, wound up kind of settling on Ride with GPS. Yeah, yeah. And actually paid for a subscription to it because you could do uh, route planning. Okay. You could plan a route and and or you could go and get other routes and download them. We wound up using it on in yeah, Big Bend. Yeah, Texas. Yep. Um, and you can download the route to your local device and you can completely be offline, not need cell phone service and still use it. Well, people have marked... You know, little water sources and, and just like, I don't know, points yeah. of interest on yeah. that. So That's handy. I've started using that for tracking. I bought the subscription, so I thought, well, I'll just use it for tracking my training stuff too and from riding or for riding around here. And it's great. It's been really good. Um, I find that it doesn't use a whole lot of battery. It's going to use some like anything that's tracking your GPS uh, you know, route. But I found that I can turn the screen off let it go black and it's still doing all of its tracking and everything in the background that minimizes the battery drain on uh, on my phone and man it's been it's been good and you can save all those keep track of them and you can know how many miles you did or whatever so I think that's a good product if you haven't ever used it maybe take a look at it what about bike maintenance during this time because you know people are dusting off the bikes and going out and you know, I've made a lot of changes lately, but I found that that's probably something good to do if you're going to be, a, you know, 30 miles from your home or your 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 uh, car. You don't want to have problems. So I've been kind of paying attention to my my tires and brakes and stuff. But I'm going to have to look at the pads. I don't know if you have any thoughts on what what would be a you know, new ride now. It's probably not as big of a deal. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's just one of those things. When we talk about shakedown crews, I think when you're riding lots of miles, you need to continuously be looking at your gear. But I think a lot of people rely on their local bike shop for that stuff. I don't know what the lifespan of disc brake pads are. I'm sure it depends upon, you know, if, you, if you're like us, we ride a lot of flat stuff, so we don't, we're not heavy breakers, I guess. Yeah. If, you, if you're doing a lot of downhill or a lot of hills, you're probably breaking more than we are. We ride you know, the KD trail is about as flat as you can come. And so we, we don't do a ton of braking, I guess, is my point. But, um, yeah, you got to keep your stuff in shape, you know. What else? Anything else on, the, on, the, on your list of uh, items to get you into the long, long days? I don't know. You know, um, nutrition and water, and like I said, I've been... I've been adjusting the bike setup to accommodate more of that. Uh, and proudly, as you mentioned yesterday, proudly had to get a new sunscreen. It's that time of year. So excited I needed sunscreen yesterday. Yeah, uh, yeah it was hot, and yesterday yeah. I put some sunscreen on it. So well. that's something else you need to reapply, because you'll be, you know, you'll be toast by noon, you know. Um, it's funny that here in Missouri we can get so cold and so hot, and so you can get quite a sunburn here. Um, even as early as April, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, so you know that's another thing. You have to keep a bunch on your on your ride, but you know you probably if you're going to be out for a while, you might really think of that. I think we often underestimate too wind burn when it's early in the spring and the wind's blowing. How that can kind of chafe and burn your skin a little bit too, just the wind blowing on it and stuff. Wind burn happens as well. So I think it's just kind of a good overall thing to do as far as uh, skin, skin skin cancer prevention too, just overall. Yeah. I've, I've been bad. I'm not saying I'm good at it either. 
over the years, when you're younger, you think you're invincible. As you get older, you realize the skin cancer is a real potential. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're probably a little smarter now than we used to be. But yesterday, I definitely sprayed the arms and and you know the nose and the ears and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. All right, well, we're going to wrap up this episode. Thanks for coming along. Again, this is going to be on YouTube where we always put it, but also on all of the places that you get podcasts, Apple, Google, so whatever whatever else is out there. Anchor FM distributes this for us out to 10 or 12 different podcast sites. If you think about it, leave us a review. We certainly would appreciate it. It helps our podcast be found. It also gives us some feedback about what you like and what you don't like. So please leave a review, and we will see you again the next time. Get out there and ride.